to show you what the common dress of a Plains Native American would have looked like in the mid-1800s. Now, the Plains Native Americans stretched out west, and they were pretty much the typical Native American everyone imagines in their mind when they think of an Indian. They lived in teepees, most of them. They wore feathered war bonnets, most of them. They wore feathers, they wore buckskins. They were your traditional Native that everyone you know thinks of in the old cartoons. But um, they were a very fascinating people, and they're much deeper people than people than they're given credit for. And they stretched of tribes, the Sioux, the Pawnee, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, um, the Blackfeet, all tribes that resided in the Plains region of the United States. Now the Plains Native American, this is the common dress of a Plains Native American in the mid-1800s, and this would be the common dress of a man and a warrior. Now, one thing that you probably noticed right off the bat is I do not have a big feathered war bonnet on. I don't have that on because I wanted to show that not all Plains Native Americans wore those. That was one, a very ceremonial item that was not even very, not even worn into war as often as people think. It was worn into a battle, but not that often because they were afraid to get them damaged. They were more for ceremonial purposes. Now, um, feathers were worn very often. But they would very often just be a single feather, one single feather adorned on the back of a head of a warrior. And these feathers were um, normally of eagle feathers. And an eagle feather wasn't something you could just get, wasn't something you could just find on the ground or shoot an eagle. It was something you had to earn through an act of bravery or a deed of courage or something, normally something you did during a battle. So that's why feathers were very important because the bald eagle had a, a lot of... Um, important meaning to the Plains Native Americans and their feathers had a lot of strength and power and good medicine to them so that's why they wore feathers but it was common just to see a single feather worn by a warrior where I wouldn't say it was more common than a, a feathered war bonnet but just as common maybe even more common so the traditional Plains Native Americans had a very unique haircut their haircuts were unique to a tribe but one thing that was very common is was to wear just braided hair and two braids, you know, Indian braids. And um, that was a common. Hair, long hair, you know, I've been asked before why did Native Americans have long hair? And it's not just because they thought, ooh, wow, long hair, that's cool. And it's not just because they couldn't cut their hair. They, they were far intelligent enough to be able to just cut their own hair. They lived on their own on the plains. Now, long hair normally symbolized... Um, depending on the on the tribe, it could symbolize bra symbolize bravery. It could symboli symbolize um, free of freedom of spirit. So long hair was a very important thing to the tribes. Now, what you're seeing is you see I have a very decorative shirt on. Now these uh that was one thing that the Plains Native Americans did. It was common to see them go without shirts, just as in the woodlands. But unlike woodland Native Americans, Plains Native Americans. Were very calm, were very proud of their uh, shirts, and they would very often wear very um, decorative shirts made of buckskin or um, buffalo skin, and they were um, very important symbols to the uh, Native American. Now, these shirts would be normally cut in a fashion that was very um, crude. It wasn't done in a way that made the shirt look very finely done, and this wasn't done. By accident, this was done on purpose. Now, the reason this was done, the reason these shirts were cut so crudely and so oddly shaped, was that they, the Plains Native Americans tried to alter the hide that they got off the animal as little as possible. And this lack of altering was done to respect the animal that the uh, the leather came from, whether it be buckskin or whether it be buffalo hide or what what it may be. Um, another thing you'll see on these buckskin shirts is they're very decorative, as you can tell. You, they start beadwork all up and down, beaded strips up and down. Now this was done, um, originally this would be done with quills, porcupine quills, just like in the woodland region. But um, af as after European contact and after the mountain men and the traders came through, they started to trade beads to the Native Americans. And one thing I'd like to point out is these beads were actually very expensive at the time because they're all made of glass and they were all... Um, shipped over into America. No one was making them here in America at the time. So these were um, 
normally ship from places like Italy, and they would cost a lot of money, so, and a lot of money to get them to the Native Americans. So one thing that, you know, is always, you know, like stereotypical is to say, oh, you know, the Native Americans trade everything away for cheap cheap beads. Well, they weren't actually very cheap. They are very expensive, um, even by them standards. And uh, these, these would be hundreds of thousands of beads woven together, still quicker than doing porcupine quills, but it still takes a long time. And these uh, strips were sewn on in this style, in this way. They were sewn in these positions on a shirt. One belief was just to hide the seams of the shirt. Um, but the style became very um, symbolic, and they would have meanings. Like this style, this design here is a design of, a, uh, of the Sioux tribe. And these designs and patterns would become personal to the tribe that you are representing. And I say that because... Um, a family would have would pass things down, like the mother or grandmother, whoever in the family would do the work for the shirts, where they would make the shirts. And, you know, they would get their own style, their own way of doing it. And that would be passed, and that whole tribe would have its own way or style of doing it. So styles and designs became particular, not only just to a, one tribe in general, but maybe even to a family, um, one family in that tribe. So, you know, wearing a, just wearing a certain design like this could say that you were Sioux, you were Pawnee, you were Blackfoot. Now, one thing that's probably in particular is when traders came over, like the mountain men, they copied a lot of things off the Native Americans. And sometimes they even copied beadwork designs. And that was an area you had to be a little bit careful, because by wearing this design, you're saying you're Sioux. Well, what if you ran into an enemy of the Sioux, like the Pawnee on the, tra on the trail? You know, just wearing this design would be reason enough for them to want to kill you because you're um, affiliating yourself with the Sioux tribe. Um, and it's kind of like you wouldn't want to go into like a bad area of Chicago wearing, you know, Crip colors when it's um, the blood's territory. It's just like that, just like in gangs, gangs have colors. Um, wearing the wrong gang color in the wrong area can get you in trouble. Wearing the wrong beadwork design back in the day on the plains could get you in trouble with the tribes of the plains. Um, Another thing you'll see here is I got scalp locks attached to my shirt. Now these scalp locks are human hair locks normally. They could be animal hair, they could be horse hair. And you'll see in other shirts too where you may see hundreds of the scalp locks all down, up and down the uh, arms. Now these scalp locks, a lot of people think, oh, those were taken from the enemy. Taken from an enemy um, that, that was killed. That's not necessarily true. That could be the case, and very well may be the case, but it wasn't too common you know, for them to have hundreds of enemies killed, that'd be an accomplishment for any man, but especially back then. So, scalp locks were kind of highly prized. So, what? why would Native Americans be wearing, you know, scalp locks on their shirt if they weren't from an enemy, or weren't necessarily from an enemy? Well, what a common practice of the time was, you know, Native Americans had a lot of um, belief around hair. Hair was important. Long hair was important. So... What was believed was, you know, your family, your mother, your brother, your father who can't fight anymore, your sister or brother who's too young to fight, they may give you a scalp, a piece of their hair, and by giving you that piece of hair, it was, and hanging on your shirt, it was like saying, we trust that this warrior has our, has, um, our, we're all, we're behind him, we're, we, he has our back, you know, we trust that he can defend us, and by wearing this scalp lock, that's what you were, um, by wearing their hair on your shirt, that's kind of what you were saying. You know, these are the, by wearing these four scalps. You know, four people have probably given their trust to me as a warrior that I can defend the tribe. And that could become very much like a, um, you know, you have hundreds of scalp locks from all sorts of people in your tribe. You know, the more scalp locks you have, the more people trust you, the more um, credibility you have. And going on the bat, not only with your own people, but going on the battlefield. You know, an enemy may see that you have hundreds of scalp locks on you. One, those could be enemy soldiers, but two, or enemy warriors, but two, those could be uh, people that trust that you're um, an efficient enough warrior to defend them. And now they're thinking, wow, if this many people think this is a good warrior, I'm in for one hell of a fight. And that's where it would be, um, where wearing many scalp locks come from. Now, one thing you'll notice, too, is on all my, on my scalp locks, on my hair wraps, on my feather wrap, you'll see red cloth. Red cloth was very quickly traded to the Native Americans. It was, it's almost a universal thing among tribes. 
red tray cloth was a very prized item. It was an item that they really wanted to get their hands on. Um, so red cloth was very important. As you can see with my breech cloth that wraps around my crotch, because um, Native Americans, Plains and Native Americans are no exception, did not wear pants. They wore cloths, and then they would wear leggings. So the breech cloth that I wear around me here is a uh, red tray cloth. Because once again, mid-1800s, red tray cloth was widely available. Now, Plains Native Americans did hold off on wearing buckskin clothing up until the late 1800s, but, you know, breech cloths were real quickly replaced with red tray cloth or some type of cloth. Um, and here you'll see I got another bag. It's a beaded bag. This is a pipe bag or a tobacco bag. Um, now these would normally hold your, um, the, your pipe and what you need to smoke, but these were often very decorated, and if you were going out to do a ceremonial thing, you'd want to show off your very decorated bag, as this one is here, because this one's beaded, or it, as most were, and you would want to show it off. So these were commonly worn just as a round camp or to a, a ceremony or to something important to show off your uh, decorative beaded bag. And, you know, these bags were not, were uh, normally very prized, and, you know, there a lot of bead work and work goes into them, same as the shirts. Um, so that's important. You'll see here I got a pair of buckskin leggings on. And these leggings are adorned with fringe. Now that's something you see that's unique to the Plains region, not the Woodland region. Things had fringe on them. My leggings had fringe on them. Now, and that's something that eventually, you know, the mountain man, the cowboy would copy off the Native Americans in doing fringe. I've been asked, why did they have fringe? What was the purpose? To be honest, I don't think anyone truly knows, but I've heard a couple interesting theories. One theory was that the, uh, when they ride horses, the swaying, the swapping would swat away flies and keep flies off them. And considering I've had a fly bothering me just during this, filming this video out here in this field, you know, that's a pretty believable theory. Another common theory that I can believe very well is water gets on these, it'll run right off this fringe and it'll help them dry quicker. So that's another theory that I believe pretty quickly. So, um... Those are just two common beliefs that very well could be the reason on why things were adorned with fringe. But never, nevertheless, they were definitely had. It was definitely a common practice to see fringe sewn on uh, clothing of the plains region. Now, um, as for the uh, moccasin here, the moccasins worn by the uh, Native Americans in the plains region, unlike the woodland tribes that would stitch right down the center, the uh, plains tribes were very often to stitch. Just like your shoe would probably be, the shoe you're probably wearing is stitched right around the foot. And this was done, you know, in that style. And these were sometimes beaded, but that wouldn't be something you'd wear um, here and there. That'd be something you'd wear strictly in ceremony or dance. Not worn, definitely not worn to battle, not worn to go on a hunt, not worn to do anything like that. So just a common pair of leather or buckskin moss was more common to see. Um... And last but not least, here you'll see a, uh, I've got a, um, a breastplate on my chest. This is a small beaded one. This is kind of like a, maybe a crow, Native American, a crow design or something along them lines. Not saying it wouldn't be a stew design, but this is something that's commonly seen in the crow to wear the looped, um, to wear the looped breastplate. But this has, um, hair pipe beads, bone hair pipe beads. Now, a lot of people think because they're bone that these were something that natives had prior to um, European contact. That's not necessarily true. They were, um, they were, there's been accounts that these bone beads were made just to trade to the Native Americans. But nevertheless, they are something you've seen wearing very early on. Whether they were pre-European contact or not, they are seen being worn very early in era. And they were bone wooden hair pipe beads. Now these glass red beads would be worn, um, and these would be traded, these were probably made in Italy, very expensive. This was all about wealth. Now yes, the big breastplates could be used as protection against primitive weapons like arrows, the chokers could be used to protect against flint knives, especially if getting your throat slashed, but um, they were more or less, you know, to get these beads you had to trade some, you had to buy some. So like wearing these beads were like wearing bling to Native Americans, and it just showed off how wealthy they were. But they did have a um, sense of, uh, there was a practical use of wearing tight ones around the neck or wearing big ones that spread your shirt. Those beads could actually protect you against an impact or a slash, at least from a primitive weapon that 
were still being wielded by Native Americans into the 1800s. Wouldn't be very helpful against guns, but that's why they still stuck around after guns were invented, because they were just um, symbolic statements and uh, showed how wealthy you were. Well, that's all I have for you in this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, if you found something interesting, please hit the like and subscribe button. It helps me out. And um, feel free to comment in below if you have any more questions about these. I hope to do more videos in the future. Thanks, and I hope you have a nice day.